All right, so out for another hike, finally, God. And uh, we're going to start the video just a little bit to talk about resilience. And uh, this is kind of my cancer talk, okay? I'm reaching out to all the people that, uh, that have or get cancer and uh, just want to talk about my experience with it and, you know, what you need to look out for, how you need to survive it you know but uh, before I get into all of that let's uh, you know let's just talk just a smidgen about resilience because it relates you know uh, you know resilience just means getting yourself prepared for all eventualities and uh, you know I'm working on that garden in the back and I made a video about that and hope you got a kick out of it if you happen to see it you know I only get six people that watch these videos but uh, let's swing around and let you just enjoy the trail back on the Florida Trail you know we've already done this portion so it's nothing new but at least you can enjoy the scenery while I talk okay so let me adjust this thing just a little bit there we go and uh, so you know this is just just my experience with uh, cancers you know I was rolling along on my IT career at the top of my world uh, working at J.P. Morgan and uh, you know they had a big vicious purge everything was political there when I was building that data center up in Michigan and uh, you know I survived it all and uh, I was going to be you know I, I was probably going to be running things and uh, you know one day my my neck swole up like a you know like you had mumps or something and uh, you know I went to see Dr. Chang never forget him and you know he he just took, you know, it wasn't him at first. I, I saw a bunch of other doctors, and, and they were all saying, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's just a, a, whatever. They had it diagnosed as something completely incorrect, and, you know, but it, it, it just kept getting worse. Then my armpits were hurting, and uh, so finally, you know, somebody sent me to Dr. Chang, a surgeon and a specialist, and uh, he didn't even, you know, he was, he had no bedside manner whatsoever, and. He just took one look at me and said, hey, when can we get Mr. Ellis scheduled for surgery? <laughs> so the, I'm just, he wasn't even talking to me. He was just talking to the nurse. And, and I'm looking at him like, man, I just met you, dude. But what, you know, aren't you going to even talk to me about this? You know, you're going to schedule me for surgery? And, uh, and, you know, and he did kind of turn around. He says, he says, he basically still talking to the nurse. He says, we're going to have to cut out one of these lymph nodes and, uh, and see what's going on here. And the nurse goes, I think we can get him in on Monday. And uh, boom. You know, just in, in uh, what, a couple of days, my life completely flipped upside down. And this is, this is what I'm talking about with resilience, folks, is, is how fast things can change in your world uh, perspective or whatever, you know. You know, like, like where, we're, where we're heading now, we're heading for an economic catastrophe. Uh, you know, I hope you're getting resilient on that. And uh, let's just talk. Well, I, you know, let's diverge just a second. You know, the the great silver squeeze is still going on, and uh, it's a. Here's a, I just want to point this out. It's a marathon, people. It's not a a sprint. Okay, you're not going to squeeze the comics. You know, because they can they can play those paper games with the derivatives forever. You know, it's not until you get all that physical silver off the market that they're going to have to. Uh, admit that they're lying bastages and uh, they don't have the silver so you know that's that's kind of where that's heading yeah but the whole world's in on it now so i think it's just a matter of time until, until uh well you know jp morgan they'll just get a little spank on the wrist oh geez you were defrauding your investors and you know they changed the prospectus on slv right you know so you don't even want to touch that with a 10 foot pole and SLV, SIVR, you don't want to touch that ETF either. PSLV is where you want to be. Okay, enough on that. So getting back to the, the cancer, he, he cut that lymph node out, and that Friday I got the diagnosis that I had lymphoma cancer. And, uh, you know, what do you do now? And see, this is, this is where, you know, you, life's experiences. You know, people, if you do get cancer, you've got to be your own... Uh, best advocate okay my first doctor I won't give his name because that'd be slander I suppose he was a real horse's ass 
and he came recommended you know I didn't know I mean, and so you know I just kind of placed myself in his hands and and went along with everything that he told me to do and uh, so let's get into a few things that 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 butcher did to me you know the first thing was he wanted a bone marrow sample and I don't know if you ever saw that movie I can't remember the name of it where the guy was donating all his organs to to people because <laughs> he knew he was going to die you know and so he, and he went out to find worthy people to be able to give them to but uh, anyway uh, in in that thing he to you know to preserve uh, his body as best he could he he wouldn't take anesthesia or or a painkiller when they went into his bone marrow and uh, that's exactly what that son of a gun of a doctor did to me he uh, he just not he did numb the area up and then he tunneled right into my hip and uh i, I you know there's only a few times in life i've cried and uh that was that was so brutal and he couldn't get it into the bone because my bones back then were nice and hard and uh he he struggled and just you know pushed that thing in and ground away you know while i was you know while i was awake and uh it, it was it was probably one of the most horrendous horrible experiences of my lifetime but you know let's just continue on but i didn't know any better you know i could have requested anesthesia and and told him you know no you're not going to get a bone marrow sample unless you put me you know under on an operating table but that guy was he was a cheap son of a gun trying to make money you know so he he knew that he would make a whole lot more money doing it the way that he did it than if he, he had to go through the hospital system and put me on under an anesthesia so let's continue on with the story so this guy the next thing that he was doing to me and I didn't really realize it at the time was uh, you know because I was on warfarin which is a blood thinner and uh, you have to get a blood give blood about you know three sometimes two or three times a week and uh, so they're stabbing well they didn't have to I, I had a port you know with that was another thing Dr. Chang did, was he put a port in my chest, and that was for the chemotherapy, so that they could pump me full of drugs to try to uh, uh, knock out the cancer, right? And uh, so, you know, I didn't really understand. Well, if, if you can get blood out of the port, and you can get, uh, uh, you know, do everything, or take the chemotherapy in, because it's, it's plugged right into an artery, you know. So they were bringing me in, and what they were doing, because he wanted to make money, they were stabbing my arms to get the blood out of my my veins. Well, what happens is, is you know, once you stab those veins over and over and over again, they develop scar tissue, and so it becomes harder and harder. And usually, the people stabbing those veins are the biggest, you know, idiots because they're. And I say idiots. I, I'm just saying inexperienced. I guess I should say, you know, they're just learning because they're, they're lab technicians. And they're paid, you know, maybe a little over minimum wage. And that's why he wanted to do it that way. Because if they go in through the port, that had to be a high-paid nurse. And so he wasn't making as much money that way. You see where I'm heading with all this? So, you know, these are things I didn't know. The other thing was when they would stab my port to... Because, you know, you've got skin that's grown over top of the port. Okay, so it's not like they're just stabbing right into it. And uh, so every time they went into that port for, for the chemotherapy, it hurt like a bastard, you know. And, uh, you know, you, you get to where you just mentally just beat down, man. You're like, oh, my God, i got to go in. They're going to stab my port. They're going to stab my veins, you know. And uh, so, I mean, but it got so bad. One time, this is when I finally drew the line, and this is what I'm talking about, about being your own advocate, was I went in, and uh, they, they stabbed my veins five times at the lab for blood okay and they couldn't get any because the, the only thing those lab techs know how to do is to stab right in the you know right around the elbow you know what i'm talking about that vein on the front of the front of your arm you know right right there you know that vein right there and uh so you know eventually you can't get blood out of that vein and uh and you know, but if you had a really i don't just just to give you a story so so after they hit me five times I said, that's it, I'm done. You're not getting, you're not stabbing me no more. You know, and, uh, and they're like, well, we gotta get the blood, the doctor said. I said, I don't care what the doctor said. If he wants to go in, he's gotta go in through my port. You know, I said, that's what the port's for. It's so he can get blood out of my doggone port. 
You know, I said, this is, this is ridiculous. I said, you're not going after my veins no more. And uh, so, you know, I went in and, you know, he was a real son of a gun about the whole thing. And I, I just sat in his office and said, well, you're not getting no damn blood. It's up to you unless you use the port. So uh, now getting, let's just uh, digress here one second. So, you know, a buddy of mine, his wife had cancer. And, uh, you know, I was telling him, I don't know how I was communicating with him. We rarely a correspondent, if at all, these days. I don't know what I did to to alienate him. He just didn't, didn't really talk to me. Ooh, almost missed the trail. <laughs> Boy, you get to talking. And uh, he says, yeah, you know, my wife, uh, they gave her a, a, a numbing cream that she would put on her port when she was getting chemotherapy. And uh, he says, in that way, it won't hurt so bad. I'm thinking, man, it had been, at that point, I think it had been darn near six months, at least three, so three to six months of them stabbing that port. And uh, so I, you know, I went in and I said, I said, my buddy was telling me about a numbing cream that I can put on my skin. And the woman goes, oh, yeah, yeah, all you needed to do was ask for it. Well, when you don't know to ask for the thing, how the hell are you supposed to, to so they did, they, you know, they prescribed me the cream. And, uh, and what you do is you put it on about a half hour before you go into the office. And uh, when you get there, the nurse wipes it off. And then when they stab that port, boom, no pain at all. It, it, it had numbed that little area. And I'm like, why did you make me suffer for three to six months? And nobody told me about it. Well, you know, what? you were just no on your own. Yeah, right. You know, how the hell? So that was the next thing that son of a gun did to me. And uh, you know we're we're continuing on, so that for, so he ruined my veins, uh, put me on all that pain with the port, stabbed me with you know trying to get in the bone marrow. So then the next uh, uh, event was I think it might have been when I got cancer the second time, because uh, you know I, I I actually went back to work and boy that was a fiasco. I mean you know when you when you've had six months of chemotherapy and you got it you got your cancer into remission and then you show back up at work, there's no sympathy whatsoever. At least not at J.P. Uh, Morgan. I'll go ahead and call them out, you know, because I think they're ripping everybody off with the silver, so what the hell. But, uh, so, you know, so they were just like, you know, you know, you can, you got to keep up. Well, things have changed in six months. You know, you're building a, it's like, imagine if you're building a house or a, uh, anything, you know, and you were there when they were pouring the concrete, and now, <laughs> now they're they're up working on the roof, you know. And you're thinking, man, you know. And so you know, it was tough, and I was trying to keep up as best I could. I, they even reprimanded me and said, oh, you, you know, because one day I, I had the pager, and I, you know, I did I, it. It was a totally uh, not correct. I was doing a great job, um, but uh, anyway, but I knew I had to keep it. Well, then the cancer came back. And so what did that doctor do to me this time? And you'd think, well, Kirk, how, why did you keep going back to him? <laughs> you know, I didn't know any better. You know, that he came recommended. I thought, you know, this is just the way it is, I, you know. And so he, he put a uh, pick line in my armpit. And this is another time that I cried. They sat there and worked on getting that pit line, pick line into my armpit for like, I, I bet it took an hour or two for them to get it in properly. And uh, the whole time, you're just in tremendous pain. And, uh, you know, and, and the thing was, it, it didn't make any sense to me about why he wanted the pick line because I was gonna go back on the operating table that following Monday uh, to put another port in. Because, you know, we knew that we're, this was gonna be round two with the chemotherapy. And so, and so then I said, you know, why not just take the pick line out while I'm under the, on the table, you know, get in the port. And he didn't even want to do that. And, uh, oh man, I, you know, I could just go on and on with stories about that son of a gun. Oh, hey, so here's, here was the, the next huge thing. All right, so I, I went on and after that, I, I, I finally got another oncologist and uh, it was awesome. I mean, this guy, sure. We'll, we'll take blood out of your port. That's no problem. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, and he was, 
he just basically went along with anything that I said because, you know, I was experienced at that point and uh, he had no problem accommodating me. So, you know, months later, maybe a couple years later, uh, you know, I, I realized because I went back to my, my doctor at Carmanos, which is where they, they had to go for a bone marrow transplant. And uh, I said, you know, throughout all of this, all you've done is treat me. I said, what caused the cancer? And uh, he says, he says, well, usually uh, lymphoma is caused by an external catalyst. And I said, well, you know, what, is, what does that mean? He says, well, it could be exposure to uh, radiation. It could be um, exposure to chemicals. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a number of things that can cause it. He says, but rarely, you know, does it just manifest on its own. You know, it's not like a, not like a hereditary type of cancer. He says, it's got to be, some, you know, something that causes it. And I said, well, how long does the cancer take to, uh, you know, if you're exposed to something? Because I was thinking back to the war in Iraq. And uh, he says, he says, well, it usually takes three to five years. And guess what, people? That was right in the window of when I was over in Iraq. And uh, so I said, I said, could it be that dose of radiation that I got when I was in Iraq? And he says, uh, he says, probably, yeah. He says, that would definitely cause it. Plus the chemicals, you know, I was dealing with a lot of chemicals when I was over there. Because, you know, that's the thing. They don't give you latex gloves. You, you're just pouring them all over your hands, you know. It's just, military is stupid, and they just don't care. And uh, so I said, man, I said, well, you know, at that time, I think I had talked to uh, yeah, the, D, uh, the Disabled American Veterans Association. And I, I said, well, they, I said, would you sign a paper attesting to that fact? And he says, yeah, sure. Yeah, he says, uh, he says, there's nothing, you know, he says, this is the number one oncologist in all of Michigan. I mean, this guy was, you, you know, there's, there's people that are smart, there's people that are damn smart, and there's just, there's Einstein brilliant, you know, and that's what this guy was. And I said, wow, you know, this is, this is great. And he and another doctor signed the two, two papers attesting to the fact that the eruption of my cancer coincided with my time over in Iraq. So, you know. It took me seven years after that, but eventually I got service connected and now I get health care at the VA thanks to him. But you know, just to tell you what that first doctor was like, because you know when you're when you're fighting the VA, you gotta you gotta get so many testimonies and paperwork and you know I have a I have full reams of folders at my house from that battle. Look at that, that's oh, a lizard. Check him out. Isn't he cool? Yeah, that's fine back here. Ooh. Almost tripped again. There he is. Oh, all right. But, uh, he's he's kind of hiding from me. We won't bother him too much. I keep scaring birds and lizards. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I'm, they're scared of me. You wouldn't want them attacking me. And uh, so, but that first doctor I was telling you, the one that tortured me so much, I went to him and asked him if he would sign a piece of paper. And that he was so vindictive because I had ditched, ditched him to go to another doctor. He would... He refused to sign anything. He said, no, I won't sign anything for you. I was like, you son of a gun, you know, you, you made a ton of money off of me. You tortured me. You, you ruined my veins. You, you stabbed my port without giving me the cream. You, you, you know, all the things that he did to me. So I just, I tell this story just for cancer. So when you get cancer, you know, I, I know it's hard because you're going to have to do your own homework. And this information is, the stuff I'm telling you is just not available anywhere. You know, you, you would have thought my wife, because she worked at the hospital at that time, would have known some of these things or known that this, this doctor that, you know, she actually recommended him, the one that tortured me, um, you know, that would have known something. And uh, I, I, you know, so anyway... Just a few things for you to, to think about if you ever do get cancer. You know, you're going to have to advocate for yourself. You know, don't let them run your veins. Don't let them, you know, if you've got a port, make them use it, you know. Even if you got to pay extra. That was the thing I told that son of a gun, you know. When I refused to let them stab my veins anymore after that five-try episode, you know, I said, I said, I don't care. I said, I'll pay you extra. I don't give a shit. I said, but you're not, 
yeah going in um he just thought that i was being a total prick and i was because i was i was done you know sometimes you, so you just have to advocate for yourself yeah we'll get into the second half of the story and talk about the bone marrow transplant in another video because this one's getting too long and uh you know i don't know if anybody will ever watch these but i hope that maybe i can help a cancer victim out there somewhere that you know that can listen to this and and know you know what to expect i mean now you know and also that's the getting back to resilience you know it just it flipped my life completely upside down because once i had the cancer the second time you know they they had changed my job at jp morgan and they told me you know you're going to have to work with the young kids and if you can't keep up we're firing your ass was basically what i was told and uh so there's no way no way i could go back to that job so you know that's how how life completely changed for me i was on top of the world folks i mean i you know i i i had been in it for 28 years and uh basically i could snap my fingers and get a job because i was current on every piece of technology you can ever imagine and uh you know so now you know when you're out of work for a year or two and that and then the great recession hit there uh while i had cancer and uh so you know then the jobs were few and far between and now you know they're looking at me and they're going why have you been out of work for two years uh you know what are you going to say you know you don't have to admit that you had cancer but you got to give some sort of explanation and they're looking you know because they're thinking you know if he's been out of work for two years there's something wrong with this guy and and they're right i mean i was a cancer survivor but that shouldn't exclude me from getting a doggone job but the jobs are few and far between and the people that were current on the technologies because two years in the it industry is like a an eternity you know things change i mean you know like autosys the job scheduling system you know i i don't remember what version of it i, I worked on but you know i'm not gonna lie and i you know it was on like version 12 and you know i've got on my resume 4.5 you know and they're like, well, you know we can't hurt you and they don't really understand yeah it may have changed quite a bit but you know you you can spin yourself up on that stuff in the it when you've got that much experience pretty doggone quick but nobody wanted to give me a chance because i didn't have version 12 on my resume yeah it's just one example you know people soft and changed and you know and all that you know twenty eight thousand dollars in education on people saw you know down the tubes because um, you know they were on another you know six versions up and uh, you know and then of course unix to being a unix administrator and you know things that by that time had mainly converted over to linux and linux is vastly different than unix i'm going to tell you and uh, and i went out and i got certified in it but you know i think i've told that story and that, that one little certification that's that's just like uh, getting cisco certified you know it's like getting that's an entry level certification and nobody wants to give a 50 year old an entry level job you know you're supposed to be coming in and being the it manager or the, you know the hey, the lead programmer or the, the lead administrator you're not supposed to come in at an entry level position and uh you know oh well, we don't want to get into the, the job stuff but i want to tell you about the cancer <laughs> peace out guys bye bye